welcome the Civil War Museum in Kenosha, who is putting on their first book club simultaneous with our virtual book signing event. Uh, so I want to say also that, you know, like the bicentennial of Lincoln, the number of books that are coming out of the sesquicentennial is getting to be enormous, but the quality is very high. I, I was surprised with that, the bicentennial, I have to admit, that the quality was that good. I'm finding the same thing is happening with the sesquicentennial, and the two books and authors we have today are certainly that. In fact, I'm going to say that these two books should be and need to be on your bookshelf for, uh, for reasons we'll, you'll hear as we come about. I'm going to first uh, introduce uh, David Blight, who is the class of 1954 professor of history at Yale University. He previously taught at Amherst College, but his first academic post, I found out, was out here in Naperville, outside Chicago, at North Central College. Currently, he's also director at the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. He's the author of the award-winning Race and Reunion, which uh, garnered eight awards, including the Bancroft Prize, Bancroft Prize, the Abraham Lincoln Prize, and the Frederick Douglass Prize. Also, Slave No More, Two Men Who Escaped to Freedom, which garnered another three book awards. Beyond the Battlefield is another of his well-known works, and Frederick Douglass's Civil War. And uh, David is now working on uh, the next book is going to be on Frederick Douglass and a full biography of him. He's the editor and author and introductions for six other books as well. Today, we're featuring his latest book, American Oracle, The Civil War and the Civil Rights Era. It's 314 pages. The Belknap Press at Harvard University Press publishes it and is $27.95. And as your reviewers say, this is an intellectual history at its best, and that it is. Uh, and we'll begin to talk about that in a few moments as well. Our other author today that we have is, I think this is your second time, Bill, uh, is Bill Harris, William Harris, uh, Professor Emeritus of History at North Carolina State University. He's the author of The Charity for All, Lincoln and the Restoration of the Union, Lincoln's Last Month, and Lincoln's Rise to the pres Presidency, which was previously on virtual book signing and is the winner of the Henry Adams Prize. Today, his latest is Lincoln and the Border States Preserving the Union, University of Kansas Press, 416 pages, and it's $34.95. This is just a book that is necessary to have. We've had numbers of books on each of the border states before and, or, or monographs on them, but nothing that synthesizes all of them at the same time. Well, as always, we begin by asking our authors uh, uh, in Echelon to talk about how they got to this particular book of theirs and generally what it's about and, uh, and why this book. Uh, maybe, Bill, you can start uh, and tell us not only how you got to the book, but uh, which were the border states and maybe very quickly how they differ. Right. Well, thank you, Dan, and I greatly appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and talk to uh, the people out there uh, and to have the opportunity to sign books and thank you so much for the kind words it's regarding it uh, and the Kansas Press I thought did a, an excellent job in the production uh, on the book. Uh, the book uh, began as sort of a survey of the border states and then I realized that a lot needed to be said about them and those states are uh, the slave states uh, that stayed in the Union, Missouri, Delaware, uh, Maryland, and Kentucky. Uh, and these were key states in the uh, success of the Lincoln and uh, the Union in, in the Civil War. And I've written out a couple, a few things that I'd like to, to, to say about it uh, uh, to get right to the point. Uh, Lincoln correctly determined that the suppression of the Southern Rebellion depended on securing and maintaining the loyalty of the border states and their support for the war also. Although most historians have concluded that these states were secure for the Union by the end of 1861, this was by no means assured, especially for Kentucky. I carried the story to the end of the war in all, all four cases. Even tiny Delaware's U.S. Senators and its state legislature while supporting the Union, proved a thorn in Lincoln's side. 
The attempts of the border states early in the war to pursue a middle ground in the conflict is described. Lincoln adopted a policy of armed neutrality, which Lincoln acquiesced in, uh, Kentucky adopted a policy of armed neutrality, which Lincoln acquiesced in rather than provoke the state into secession. Maryland attempted a similar policy, but retreated from it when Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus and authorized the army to arrest state legislators and Baltimore officials. Both Kentucky and Maryland officials, paradoxically, believed that by taking a neutral stance in the war, they could become the instrument for a compromise that would end the conflict and restore the Union. On the other hand, Missouri Governor Claiborne Jackson pursued a policy of armed neutrality while siding with the Confederacy and not the Union. He overreached and was forced out of power by federal forces on the General Nathaniel Line. A provisional governor, government under Hamilton Gamble was established by the reconvened state convention uh, and, and it threw its support behind the Union. In all of these states except Delaware, the situation for the Union remained in a state of flux which greatly tested Lincoln's leadership and his relationship with the state governments and military commanders. Although not free from mishaps and misjudgments about affairs in the border states, which I go into on occasion in the book, Lincoln's patient and skillful leadership proved crucial in retaining the border state support and ultimately securing the end of slavery. I hope this book will give you the reader a better understanding of the importance of the border states in the Civil War and provide insights into Lincoln's leadership in gaining and maintaining the, the support of these critical states for the war and ultimately for emancipation. Thank you, Bill. That is a good summation of what you've written for us, and we'll get into some of the details as we go along. Uh, David, please, same thing. Uh, give us uh, how you got to this book. Why this book now? Uh, well, thank you, and thank you, Dan, for having me here tonight, and all of your staff. Uh, if anyone's never been here, this is one of the great bookstores in the United States, book bookshops in the United States. Um, and thank you to the live audience. Um, I think I did this book, if I'm honest about it, for basically two reasons. One was that I wanted to write a book that would be somehow a part of the sesquicentennial, period, but I wanted to do it by going back to another commemoration and do some serious history of how Civil War memory had been forged and fought over at another time, and the obvious time to do that was the centennial uh, during the 1950s and 1960s. Um, the second reason this, I did this particular kind of book, to be honest, is that these are four writers that I had always wanted to write something about. Uh, Robert Penn Warren, Bruce Catton, Edmund Wilson, and James Baldwin, with also uh, a nod uh, in the epilogue to Ralph Ellison. Um, it began with Robert Penn Warren. Uh, I had quoted Robert Penn Warren so many times in my other books, in everything I've ever written about Civil War memory, whether it were essays or Race and Reunion. His book, The Legacy of the Civil War, that little book published in 1961, is still where everyone should start on the problem of the memory of the Civil War. It's a marvelous, still a marvelous meditation on this problem. Bruce Catton, I uh, grew up reading. Uh, I confess, as a teenager, I used to pray for rain in my summer jobs so I could get afternoons <laughs> off to go hide somewhere and read Terrible Swift Sword, or Stones at Appomattox, or whatever book I was reading at the time. I was one of his hundreds of thousands of readers he captured with his magnificent, exquisite prose style and narrative military history. But no one has ever written anything about Bruce Catton, who has probably had more readers about the Civil War than anyone who ever lived, and for good reason. I mean, good reason he had the readers. There really isn't a good reason no one's ever written about him and he left a massive trove of papers, which we could talk about. Third, Edmund Wilson, uh, of course, wrote uh, one of the great books of the Civil War centennial era. Perhaps the most important single work of the Civil War centennial is his massive 800-page tome uh, called Patriotic Gore, 
one of my favorite book titles. Uh, it's a massive literary history of the Civil War where he treats literature uh, through a very broad definition. He defined literature uh, that was produced by the Civil War generation as letters, speeches, memoirs, diaries, and fiction. And uh, Wilson was the greatest literary critic of the 20th century, and in Patriotic Gore he wrote a brilliant but confounding and contradictory and bothersome book, which was a literary sensation in 1962. So that needed to be here. But to study Edmund Wilson means you have to read a lot of other of his works. And uh, I thought I could do Edmund Wilson on the cheap, but the truth is I couldn't. And I was also lucky that his papers are at Yale, his massive papers and correspondence, which helped. And fourth and finally, uh, James Baldwin. Now, he seems to be the odd one out here, uh, and I've been asked this a number of times. The other three were all born right around the turn of the 20th century, and I do a good deal of biography of each of these writers in the book. Baldwin's not born until 1924. He's the next generation. He's the African-American writer, obviously, in the book. He grew up in dire poverty in Harlem at 131st and Park Avenue, as he put it, Uptown Park Avenue. Um, uh, he became, of course, a novelist uh, in the 1950s in exile in France. Uh, he's well known for his fiction, but he is also well known and should be even better well known for his nonfiction essays. And it was James Baldwin above anyone else who became, in essence, the literary voice of the civil rights movement, uh, particularly, again, through his nonfiction essays. In his collections, 1955, uh, Notes of a Native Son, and then the collection called Nobody Knows My Name in 1961, and then his most famous work, The Fire Next Time, uh, which was written initially as a manifesto essay in the New Yorker magazine, published in 1963, bestseller in the United States for nine months in 1963. What Baldwin was about during these years of the Civil War centennial was constantly in his writing and in his speaking, and he became uh, perhaps the most ubiquitous, itinerant speaker of the civil rights era, as much as Martin Luther King, as much as Malcolm X. What Baldwin was always trying to do is to get Americans to develop, as he saw it, a deeper, more sensitive, and in his terms, more tragic sense of history. Uh, if you go back and read any of Baldwin's essays, just dip into Notes of a Native Son, or dip into particularly Nobody Knows My Name, which I think is his best writing, or The Fire Next Time, what you're reading is a manifesto about the nature of history, about why it's so important to have a sense of history, and in his view, why Americans, by and large, had never faced their past with slavery, racism, the Civil War, and Reconstruction. In his own way, James Baldwin was a kind of literary historian without any training. Mm -hmm. uh, so I put the four of them together, and what it allows me in the end to do is to have, a, I hope, a deep reflection on how the Civil War centennial, this massive public phenomenon, which was rather a debacle, as some of us know, and the civil rights movement, and how these two huge phenomena came together at the same time, or frankly did not come together, because what really happened in the 50s and 60s is that the Civil War centennial as a series of events and the civil rights movement as a revolution were like uh, planets orbit orbiting separate suns, is the way I put it in the book, because they almost never occupied the same space. So it's a way of trying to understand how did, how did this country commemorate the Civil War at its 100th anniversary in the midst of the Civil Rights Revolution on the way to trying to at least think about, so where we are, where are we now um, at 150?